Hello, and welcome back to Arise Global Business Report. Last month, Nigeria's Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Mrs. Zainab Ahmed, said the federal government will henceforth accompany its annual budget with finance bills. The 2020 appropriation bill, currently under review of the National Assembly, was presented on the 8th of October 2019 by President Muhammadu Buhari with a finance bill. The bill aims to raise government revenues, reform our tax laws to align with best practices, create incentives for investment and support medium and small scale enterprises. Analysts say Nigeria has a complex tax system and a low tax to GDP ratio of 6%, resulting in unsustainable fiscal deficits and a heavy debt burden. The Minister of Finance, Mrs. Zainab, has also said that the federal government is targeting a tax to GDP ratio of 15% by 2023, implying additional revenues of over $45 billion in just four years. With us to discuss these issues on Global Business Report is Mr. Ajibola Olomola, a veteran tax expert with Mergers and Acquisitions Tax and Legal Team. You are welcome to this special edition of Global Business Report. Thank you very much for indeed for coming on the program. Can you kick off by helping us to demystify the, the contents of this finance bill? Tell us what's in it and how it differs from the current uh, tax uh, legislation. Thank you very much, uh, Bode, for having me at Arise. Good morning to you and to your viewers, and for the opportunity also to talk about the finance bill of 2019 which in itself is epochal. It's significant that Nigeria is beginning to join the League of Nations that moderates the economy by use of fiscal instruments such as bills of this nature, which make changes to try to align the microeconomy with the macroeconomic direction of the federal government in terms of their monetary policies and all other elements of fiscal planning. In terms of the directionality of the bill, what it does is, to my mind, to begin to show signals of the direction towards which Nigeria will go in seeking to raise fiscal revenues with which it intends to finance the budget. And the very first significant thing that this bill does is to lessen and almost mitigate the tax burden on a very vital sector of the Nigerian economy, the small and the medium enterprises sector of the economy to try to mitigate the challenges they currently face in complying with the tax legislation, reduce the tax burden on that very important sector of the economy, and by so doing, attract many of them for the first time into the tax net. So what this bill does in a nutshell is to begin to reposition the fiscal environment in Nigeria towards attracting investment, encouraging Nigerians to invest in Nigeria, grow capital, and also grow, grow the uh, labor market, grow our economy, and in a sense, begin to change the narrative of the economy. Well, if you look at the bill, what are the specifics in terms of uh, the, the features of the bill? What, 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 what's in the bill exactly, particularly the, the changes when you compare what we have to what um, uh, we, uh, we used to have? Well, the, the, the most important change uh, that most Nigerians have picked up upon is the increase in the VAT rate from 5% to 7.5%, which has been approved by both the Senate and also the House of Representatives of Nigeria after public hearings. That's the most material change that most people have picked up upon. However, in recognition of the fact that very large sections of the economy are vulnerable and sensitive to tax rate change, what the finance bill has then done 
is an attempt by the government to moderate the effect of the rate increase, shift it to the higher producing elements of the economy, and exempt small and medium scale enterprises who are businesses with a turnover of 25 million and below from paying VAT, for example. Uh, in addition, the government has proposed to expand the list of items that are exempted from VAT to include most items that most Nigerians would utilize in terms of basic food items and the like. And a very extensive list of tax-exempt items has been provided by the tax bill in a sense to ensure that the most vulnerable sections of Nigeria will not be negatively impacted by virtue of the VAT rate increase. Well, Ajibola, they, they, they say nothing can be as certain as death and taxes, but somehow Nigerians have been able to dodge uh, taxes. If you look at the compliance, they're sh it's shockingly low. and. Um, Tax compliance, for example, if you just looking at some of the numbers we got at a PwC study of recent income tax compliance is, is under 2%. Land use property tax compliance is about 6.7%. Business permits just 15%. Tenement rate 7.8% and so on. Many argue that the problem that we have is a compliance problem. How does this bill address the, the compliance issues? That's a very good question, uh, Bode. And the way the bill has attempted to help to motivate an increase in our tax to GDP ratio, and also the compliance problem that the Federal Inland Revenue Service has commented upon in times past, is to lower the tax burden on companies and therefore incentivize them to come into the tax net, if you like. I'll give you an illustration. If a business or a small business is currently staged as a partnership, the tax they will pay is not affected. It's still an effective 20% of their profits that they will pay tax on under the Personal Income Tax Act. But the bill is proposing a change to the company's Income Tax Act such that if that same business were registered as a company, they would face zero taxation up to revenues uh, of 25 million and below, and above 25 million up to 100 million, a reduced tax rate below 30%. That then is a clear motivation for businesses that are currently not registered as companies to come into the formal net, register with the companies and allied matters, under the Companies and Allied Matters Act with the Corporate Affairs Commission in order to seek the protection that the finance bill provides which means that more businesses will come in from the cold, which means that more companies come into the tax net. And once they are then in the tax net, the ability of the tax authority to monitor compliance then becomes a little bit more enhanced. And so if you also take the narrative that by effectively investing capital in the business of companies that are small, those companies will expand. They will use their monies to reinvest in their businesses. Small companies currently produce 74% of labor in Nigeria, which means they can employ more people, they can grow their business, they can expand, and invariably, eventually, uh, grow their business above the minimum tax exempt rate of 25 million or even 100 million for the 20% tax reduction. And then what you then find is that they become corporate tax citizens. It's a theory. It's a big ambition of the government. It is the government choosing to believe that if Nigerian companies were incentivized, they would come willingly into the tax net and use self-assessment to discharge their tax burden. So what this bill represents is an investment by government in the idea that Nigerians are willing to do the right thing if they were properly incentivized to do so. 
Well, let's hope that uh, th that works. The other thing, of course, is that we understand that banks will not be able to open accounts without proper tax identification number and so on. H how is that going to work? What is the proportion of accounts now that have uh, tax identifiable or identification numbers and um, how feasible is this? Right, uh, and that's a, another very good question, uh, Bode. Already, uh, the bank opening forms that are typically motivated to uh, businessmen that seek to open accounts in Nigeria require them to provide information as to their corporate status, their, the identity of their directors, the uh, bank account numbers and BVN numbers of their directors, the tax identification numbers. What the bill has done is merely to formalize what is already included by banks under the auspices of the central bank know your customer directives to make it formal and codify in the tax law that, that banks should not open accounts for businesses that do not have tax identification numbers. It is hoped that by closing this loophole, it must be better possible for regulatory authorities to match the operationalization of bank accounts with contributions to the economy by way of tax rendition. Okay, let's look at some of the other opportunities. Where, where do you see the, the incentives? We hear of incentives, where are the incentives and, and where, are the, where are the challenges likely to be with this uh, bill? Um, very good question, Bode. I'll start with the incentives and then I'll move on to discuss a few of the challenges that, have, that we have noticed. In terms of the incentives, there are very many provisions of the current tax regime that operate in a manner that disincentivizes investment by companies. I'll give an illustration. We, there's a provision in the tax code that punishes companies that fail, that, that retain profits. So if you make profits in a, in a year of operation and you do not distribute those profits as dividends and retain that profit in your business for the purpose of reinvestment, in the year where you eventually distribute those profits, you will likely pay a tax on those profits, even though you had previously paid tax on the profits in the year when the profits were initially realized. That is effectively a double tax on profits which then disincentivizes companies and puts pressure on companies to not reinvest their profits in themselves and grow their manufacturing capacity, but in a sense, always to declare dividends in order to avoid a double tax. Section 19 is now being modified to exempt from its application businesses that are at risk of suffering a double tax. With these changes, Section 19 will do what it was originally intended to do, which is to capture businesses that are aggressively failing to report tax revenues whilst still um, distributing profits to their shareholders. That's a significant incentive. And so many companies in manufacturing, many companies in telecommunications are now able to choose to retain profits that have been made in any year in the good years of their business to expand their capital base, increase their labor and productivity, and in the hope of generating larger profits in future. This is a very good incentive that has been introduced by the finance bill. A few other incentives abound, but I'd like to move on to a few of the challenges that we have also noticed. Of course, the loudest noise has come from the changes that have been made to the tax regime for petroleum companies in Nigeria. And in fact, for petroleum companies, it's been uh, one change after the other. Like you know, uh, only a few weeks ago, the, go the president also signed modifications to the Deep Offshore Act, uh, which regulates uh, production sharing contracts in Nigeria by amending the royalty rates and requiring some of those companies to pay royalty uh, even on acreages where previously they would have had zero royalty to pay. Well, a few weeks later, we now have a change in the finance bill that proposes to remove 
the ring fencing that previously was available to profits that have been taxed under the Petroleum Profits Tax Act and require that those profits, when distributed to shareholders, should suffer an additional tax of 10% withholding or 7.5, depending on the country or where the recipient of the dividend is, is incorporated or resident. So that's an additional tax that previously did not exist um, for, for businesses in the oil industry. And that's a matter that will be a challenge when such businesses begin to consider where to invest their capital and to compare the return they will obtain were they to invest in Nigeria with returns that may be obtainable were they to invest elsewhere. And so ultimately, it falls into what will be considered by such companies in their investment analysis to determine whether investing in Nigeria will continue to make sense in the long term. And it's an area I believe the government itself would also focus on, uh, probably when passing the petroleum industry bill, to see what other changes can be made to ensure that Nigeria remains a competitive environment for all companies to come and do business. Indeed, we are still waiting for the uh, petroleum industry bill uh, to, to, be, to be passed. But let's move on to uh, talking about best practices. This bill is supposed to take Nigeria closer to best practices as far as uh, tax legislation is concerned. What's your own view on that? Again, Bode, you've asked a very astute question and made a very insightful observation in terms of global best practice. So for several years now, the OECD, as well as the United Nations, has uh, undertaken research into multinationals' practice in the area of erosion of the profit base uh, through the base erosion and profit shifting um, framework that has been enunciated by both uh, institutions. And so recommendations have been made to countries to try to align their fiscal framework with the reality of doing business in a modern world, where the world is now a global village. You don't have to be physically in a country to do business in that country. Now, hitherto, our tax laws have been framed on the assumption that companies or businesses that are physically located in Nigeria should contribute tax in Nigeria. And so the question has been, how do we move the fiscal framework in Nigeria and other countries towards the directionality of which international trade is going? What the finance bill has now proposed happily is that provisions have been included by the Honorable Minister in the bill to capture the effects of digital trade and also the effects of international trade, where Nigeria is the recipient or staging area for such trade without necessarily the physical presence of the company that's undertaking the trade. And so the finance bill has made a proposal for digital trade where a significant economic presence is determined to have been triggered for such operators to fall into the Nigerian tax net. Now, Nigeria has not gone the full nine yards by prescribing what significant economic presence should be. What Nigeria has now done is to reserve to the Honorable Minister for Finance the ability to make a declaration of what would constitute significant economic presence by virtue of which uh, international trade uh, participants would fall into the tax net in Nigeria. But I'll share with you uh, that what the OECD recommends to be a significant economic presence would be revenues in excess of, say, 750 million US dollars. It very well might be that Nigeria will stage its own definition to be below that threshold, because that threshold may be considered rather excessive from a Nigerian perspective. Uh, for those of us who follow international affairs, we saw what happened when France tried to align with this best practice in the last few months by imposing a tax on digital trade, uh, and they defined significant economic presence to be 500 million euros. And of course, that then led to negotiations with the United States of America on behalf of companies like Amazon, Google, and so on, and then an agreement was reached. 
So it is hoped that by vesting the minister with an ability to determine what constitutes significant economic presence in Nigeria, she can go into a consideration of relevant factors in making that determination, which will then be available as a guide to companies that undertake international trade. Well, to another question on um, the, the, the bill, you recall that the Minister of Finance, uh, Mrs. Zainab, has also said the federal government is targeting uh, a tax to GDP ratio of 15% uh, by 2023. I did the rough calculation on the numbers. That means additional tax revenues of over $45 billion uh, in just four years. Now, now is that realistic? Let's, let's uh, look at where we are. Our entire budget is less than $30 billion. Uh, Current levels are so low. Do you think uh, it's possible to do additional $45 billion in, in just four years? It's an intriguing question, really, as to whether we can achieve it. Uh, but there's no, there's no gain saying that at the current levels of the budget and fiscal planning in Nigeria, should we even be talking about a budget of 8 trillion naira, 10 trillion naira? Is that what we need to move Nigeria forward? I think, to answer your question, a lot will depend on how rapidly we can achieve a, an increasing level of industrialization of the country. How quickly can we get the productive factors of Nigeria to work in the right direction? How quickly can we grow our economy? How quickly can we grow our GDP? If we can grow our GDP by means of the investments that this government is seeking to make, for example, the government is also trying to borrow money or find other ways and means of financing public expenditure with a view to improving infrastructure, and other aspects of the economy, in the hope that by doing so, they can facilitate the ease of doing business in Nigeria, attract investment into Nigeria, provide employment for the teeming majority of our people in Nigeria, and then by so doing, grow the economy. If we are able to do that, then we can improve on our tax to GDP ratios by means of increasing contributions, by tax and other means of financing the government. Now, I'm not saying that I think we can achieve 45 billion, but I think that we can definitely make significant improvements from where we are now in terms of revenue accretion to the federal government. Well, very quickly, PwC, they did a recent survey of, of executives and found out that 57.3% uh, uh, are not happy with, with the VAT rate increases of the companies they surveyed. They see it as an additional cost burden, given the fact that businesses in Nigeria have a lot to cope in terms of lack of infrastructure, electricity, and so on. What are your own thoughts on this uh, VAT hike? Very good question. And of course, uh, for most businesses, we want to see stability in terms of our costs and our costs of operation. And so, of course, businesses do not like to see tax increase. Uh, and of course, we would like to stay where we are. But ultimately, you've got to then say to yourself, what will be the impact of a VAT rate increase on the economy? And of course, without the mitigation that the finance bill has tried to provide, perhaps the impact might have been potentially uh, negative. But when you then frame the proposals in the finance bill with the mitigation that the finance bill provides, firstly, to small businesses, secondly, to everyone in terms of the class of items that are completely exempted from VAT, it's arguable, and I think you will find that the impact will be nuanced. There will be some impact, but I think ultimately the impact will be positive because if more, ex if more items are now exempted from VAT, what you will probably find will be a reduction in your costs if you were a small business as opposed to an increase in your costs. Furthermore, if you as a whole were exempted from paying VAT, again, another significant reduction in your costs of operation as opposed to an increase in your cost of operation. So definitely, for large companies and companies that are still in the VAT net, 
you will see an increase in your VAT costs. But for a large section of the economy, you will see a, re a significant reduction in those VAT costs. So ultimately, the question will be what the overall impact on the economy might be. And I think until we get to a point where we achieve complete VAT recoverability, then until then, we'll probably continue to have a nuanced effect. But I should say that my reading of the finance bill is that this is not the destination that the minister is signaling, that the president is signaling. I think what they are signaling with this bill is a direction. So 7.5%, increase to 7.5% is an initial direction towards which our VAT will go. I think you will probably find that over the next few years, we will see further changes to VAT, perhaps hopefully to put us in a place where we can achieve input VAT recoverability, which is taken for granted in many countries of the world. But today in Nigeria, we do not have input VAT, 100% uh, input VAT recoverability. The VAT we can recover is limited to three items. But we should get to a point where all companies can achieve input VAT recoverability. So it's a direction we are going. And this finance bill signals that direction in the CIT area, which is the company's income tax area, in the VAT area, and in so many other areas. And we need to see how this, how this plays out over the next few years. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's all we can take. But um, we'll have wanted to ask about execution because, uh, as you and I know, um, it's one thing to have a bill. It's another thing to be able to execute it properly, put in place the right technology, infrastructure, and everything you need to make sure that uh, it works well. Thank you very much. That was Mr. Ajibola Olomola, partner and head of the tax practice of KPMG in Nigeria, discussing the issues uh, related to the Nigeria Finance Bill. <laughs>